Band rivalries and feuds are nothing new, but one of the stranger feuds to emerge out of the 90s were between alternative rock bands Pearl Jam and Nirvana. But was it real, or was it just all created by the media? And what did the band members and their peers feel about the whole thing? That's what we're going to explore in today's video. It seems strange to think that Pearl Jam and Nirvana had some sort of feud or rivalry between them when you consider everything that's been put out there about the Seattle music scene. If you've read the books Everybody Loves Our Town or Grunge is Dead, both of which are great books, I highly recommend them, they paint Seattle, especially in the 80s, as a place which was a tight-knit community and bands helped each other out. So the rivalry between the bands took people by surprise considering they both shot to popularity around the same time and struggled with fame. If anything, both groups should have understood what the other was going through. While Pearl Jam and Nirvana sonically sounded different, the media lumped them in together under the umbrella term grunge, and they still both appealed to the same generation of people, as the LA Times would put it, and I quote, a generation of young people aged 15 to 25 who feel they have been shortchanged by the American dream. Pearl Jam guitarist Mike McCready would tell author Mark Yarm in the book Everybody Loves Our Town, I remember after the New Year's Eve 1991 show, somebody running onto the bus and saying Nirvana had just hit number one. I remember thinking, wow, it's on now. It changed everything. We had something to prove that our band was as good as I thought it was. In the same book, Pearl Jam manager Kelly Curtis revealed how Epic Records, Pearl Jam's label, initially struggled to market the band. They didn't know whether Pearl Jam was metal or alternative, but he credited Nirvana for opening the door to radio. Pearl Jam frontman Eddie Vedder would admit in the same book that while he thought Pearl Jam's debut 10 was a good record, he thought Nirvana's first album was better. Although it's not clear whether he was referring to Nirvana's first actual album Bleach or their major label debut Nevermind. The website knkx.org would interview Charles R. Cross, who was a local Seattle writer and author of the Kurt Cobain biography Heavier Than Heaven, who claimed the feud stemmed from several interviews Cobain did. He was tired of discussing his drug addiction and wanted to talk about anything else, and it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to talk about other bands in both good and bad ways. One of those bands was Pearl Jam. Given that Nirvana and Pearl Jam were some of the biggest bands in the world at that time, Cobain's comments carried a lot of weight, and the media immediately latched onto them. In 1992, Nirvana would grace the cover of Rolling Stone magazine for the first time, and he would talk openly about his disdain for Pearl Jam. Although Cobain is thrilled when underground bands infiltrate the mainstream charts, he's outraged by others who are riding the coattails of the alternative boom. His favorite target is Pearl Jam, also from Seattle, which he accused of corporate, alternative, and cock rock fusion in a recent Musician Magazine interview. He'd tell the magazine, every article I've seen written about them, they mention us, and they're baiting that fact. I would love to be erased from my association with the band and other corporate bands like the Nymphs and a few other felons. I do feel a duty to warn the kids of false music that's claiming to be underground or alternative, they're jumping on the alternative bandwagon. In the same piece, Rolling Stone would even reach out to Pearl Jam bassist Jeff Ament, who would say, I don't know what I did to him. He has a personal vendetta against us, he should come to us. To have that sort of pent up frustration, the guy obviously must have some really deep insecurities about himself. And it wasn't just a man who Cobain rubbed the wrong way, as in the same book former Pearl Jam drummer Dave Abruzzisi would reveal, when Nirvana were going on stage at Cow Palace, I said have a good night to Kurt and he growled at me. The drummer would recall grabbing Cobain and almost got into a fist fight with him, but Pearl Jam's tour manager broke it up. Let's talk about some of Cobain's other interviews discussing Pearl Jam, and he would tell MTV his thoughts on the band here. Have you always been friends? What's we, up with you never, and Eddie? We never had a fight, ever. I just have always hated their band. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like you're friends or anything. No, well, I mean, I, I consider him a person that I really like. I mean, we've had a few conversations on the phone. I, I really like him. I think he's a nice, really nice person. Cobain would also give an interview to Rolling Stone magazine in 1994, where he had an exchange that went as follows. It's never been entirely clear what this feud with Vetter was about, to which Cobain would respond, there never was one. I slagged them off because I didn't like their band. I hadn't met Eddie at the time. It was my fault. I should have been slagging off the record company instead of them. They were marketed, not probably against their will, but without them realizing that they were being pushed into the grunge bandwagon. To which the interviewer followed up with, don't you feel any empathy with them? They've been under the same intense follow-up album pressure as you have. To which Cobain responded, yeah I do, except I'm pretty sure they didn't go out of their way to challenge their audience as much as we did with this record. 
referring to in utero. They're a safe rock band. They're a pleasant rock band that everyone likes. It just kind of pisses me off to know that we work really hard to make an entire album's worth of songs that are as good as we can make them. I'm going to stroke my ego by saying that we're better than a lot of bands out there. What I've realized is that you only need a couple of catchy songs on the album. The rest can be BS bad company ripoffs and it doesn't matter. And it would be ironic that many of Nirvana's peers saw Pearl Jam as staying more tried and true to the punk rock ethos. Because in reality, some of the members of Pearl Jam, including bassist Jeff Ament and guitarist Stone Gossard, played in two bands prior to Pearl Jam, including Green River and Mother Love Bone, who were hugely influential on the music scene in Seattle. Green River was hailed as one of the first so-called grunge bands to come out of the city, and they were on the scene years before Nirvana even showed up. In the book Everybody Loves Our Town, Green River and Mudhoney vocalist Mark Arm would recall touring with Nirvana towards the later part of their career, and how much of a painful existence it was, revealing Pearl Jam probably did as much for unknown bands as Nirvana ever did. We did the first few weeks of the In Utero tour in the States, and by this time Nirvana was a big machine, and that tour was effing painful, the whole vibe that was going on. They'd surrounded themselves with so many gross management people, just sick gross people that I would never want to associate myself with in any kind of relationship. And this is from a band that came up through sub pop, through punk rock roots. In the same interview, Arm would praise Pearl Jam for calling the shots in their career while still being signed to a major label, including stopping doing music videos and picking a fight with Ticketmaster. In fact, I've done a whole video on why Pearl Jam stopped making music videos, the link is down below. Meanwhile, Nirvana's former manager Danny Goldberg discussed the rivalry in his book Serving the Servants, revealing Cobain was competitive with other bands. By 1993, Pearl Jam was commercially bigger than Nirvana, as Pearl Jam's second record Versus outsold in utero and set first week sales records with Goldberg revealing to the New York radio station Q104.3, there's no question Vetter was somebody that he personally did like, but he felt competitive with Pearl Jam and he wanted Nirvana to be number one, no question about it. It was a bigger record and it was Pearl Jam's moment. Kurt was not crazy about that. He called me once and said, geez, I've seen three Pearl Jam videos on MTV and our video only once. Is someone mad at us there? Is there something we should do? I said, Kurt, these things go in cycles, it's fine, they like you at MTV. But even some of the staff at MTV came to Pearl Jam's defense in the feud, with MTV VJ Steve Isaacs penning an open letter to Rolling Stone following Nirvana's first cover story, calling Kurt's attitude pretentious towards other bands. Cobain would read the letter and was so upset at it that when MTV filmed Nirvana's tour in Spain, the band sent the television network a fax that read, anybody but Steve can interview us. Fast forward to April of 1994, and the rock world would be shocked by the death of Cobain. Vetter recalled hearing the news of Cobain's death, revealing in the same book that he was staying in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., and destroyed everything in sight. It was just a coincidence that at that point in time, the members of Pearl Jam, minus Abruzzisi, were in the nation's capital to meet President Clinton. At that point in time, the Clinton administration was looking at closing several military bases around the country. Also happening at the same time was that Pearl Jam was in a battle with Ticketmaster over their service fees on concert tickets, so the band wasn't playing Ticketmaster venues. Pearl Jam thought they could play some benefit shows to raise money for the impacted communities. Pearl Jam manager Kelly Curtis would recall to author Mark Yarm, We got summoned into the Oval Office and Clinton asked Eddie if he should address the nation about Cobain's death. Eddie said, I don't think you should address the nation. Vetter was worried there would be a possible copycat effect of bringing attention to Kurt's death. Almost a week after Cobain's passing, Pearl Jam would appear on Saturday Night Live as a musical guest, and Vetter paid a quick tribute to Cobain as you can see here. Saturday Night Live this past weekend, and at the end of the show, while cast members and band mingled on stage, uh, singer Eddie Vetter opened his shirt to reveal the letter K drawn on his t-shirt over his heart. A quiet salute to departed Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. In Pearl Jam's documentary 20, which came out in 2011, a clip would emerge of Cobain and Vetter slow dancing to Eric Clapton's song Tears in Heaven during the 1992 MTV Video Music Awards. And as recently as last year, Vetter would appear on Howard Stern's Sirius XM show, and the radio host brought up the rivalry between both bands, to which Vetter replied, I probably could have agreed with some of the things he said. While also saying success had its pitfalls going on to say, the only thing that bothered me about the alleged rivalry was because it was public and people were reacting to it. It wasn't like between us. There was a certain writer who pulled a quote of Jeff Immense out and pulled a quote of Kurtz out, and that made for interesting press. But really, I always felt like it was us against the world, our town against the world, not our band against another band. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.